Okay, no worries. It's not going to bother me. No worries. All right, good evening. Welcome to Anchor Church. <laughs> you guys are online while we're having a conversation. We've got work happening in the building while we're having church tonight because we uh, had an HVAC issue that was not a major one, but it's still being repaired even as we're working right now. So <laughs> I'm having a conversation about that while we're starting Bible study. So I apologize to you online getting dropped in the middle of that conversation. But welcome to church. If you're in this room or if you are on the other side of this screen or if you're watching recording, I'm glad that you're here with us. It's good to see you. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us tonight. Uh, let's see. Oh, I've got comments already. Wow, it's going to be lively. I haven't even started yet. <laughs> Should be a good night. Oh, as always, uh, if you're interested in giving, you can find a link down below. Uh, the link we've been using for quite a while is still there, but it should go away by the end of the month, and we're going to get a new service that's less expensive, so uh, we will have more of your money actually going into the ministry we do here because it does cost a small fee for us to do the electronic transaction through our bank that we've been doing. So, But in the meantime, if you're interested in giving to the ministry here, if you'll do that at the link down below, um, as of right now, none of that money goes to me. I still do not draw a salary. I have not for six years. One day the Lord will change that, and that will be wonderful. But rest assured that I'm not just some guy on the Internet taking your money. It will go into Anchor Church. We're a 501c3, and all of that money goes in directly into ministry, keeping the lights on and the Internet connected and feeding hungry people and ministering to people that are uh, in need and, and underprivileged and um, finding ways to get the Word of God to as many people as possible in the area where we live. So. That is that, and that's all I've got in the way of business tonight that we'll talk about with the online crowd. If you want to know more, you should be here in person. Just just, just going to throw that in there. Um, I don't ever pressure anyone. I understand there's a lot of you at home that can't get here for some reason or that watch from a distance, and we're honored that you consider us part of your walk with the Lord, and I thank you for that. However, if you're local and you're able to be here, there are things that you miss if you're not in the building and not connected physically to the body that's here. So thank you for being here from a distance or or using uh, the resource of the internet when you don't have another option. But if you could be here, we'd love to have you. Tonight we're going to be looking at the 23rd Psalm, verses 1 through 6 of Psalm 23. Um, if you give titles to your notes while you're taking notes tonight, Living in God's Grace is the presentation. Um, I've had the wonderful pleasure of having someone here from out of the country this week. He's going to be here for a little while with us, and we actually had a conversation about this while I was in the process of preparing, and I'm like, Lord, what are we supposed to share this week? And I was studying on several other topics, and this is the one that seemed to keep coming to the forefront in conversations with my friend and in my own study and review. And I've, I've talked through this from several perspectives, and in several ways tonight we're going to look at it from the perspective of God's grace. So I'm going to pray, we're going to read this passage, we'll hear what the Lord has for us tonight. Father, thank you this evening for gathering us together to hear your word. Thank you for preserving your word for us so that we can read it, so that we can apply it, so that we can hear it, so that we can use it to bring you glory in our own lives. Let your spirit be present with us tonight wherever we are listening. And God, may it convict us, may it encourage us, may it empower us to do what you've asked us to do. Don't let us leave here just having heard a clever speech or read an interesting book report, but let us leave here changed because we spent time with your people and time in your presence. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6. Yes, I'm going to read it. You've probably heard it before. I'm going to read it out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Beautiful passage. David was a beautiful poet and wrote some wonderful work. Tonight I want to look at this from the perspective of the grace of God. We so often hear about a gospel and even read this passage from the perspective of the good things that God wants to do for me and how wonderful it is that God loves me and wants to take care of me and wants to be with me. And suddenly we very quickly find ourselves where I become the subject of everything I'm talking about when we speak of the goodness of God. And I want to start with this tonight. God does want good things for us, but not at the expense of the entire kingdom of God. Our personal benefit is not the end goal of our relationship with Christ. 
The Lord did not simply come to save us for us to be the end result and for the goodness that I want and the blessing that I want and the things that I think I should get out of life to be the whole reason I got saved. Well, I got saved so I wouldn't go to hell. I got saved so the Lord would bless me. I got saved because I wanted to be important. I got saved because my life was terrible and this made my life better. While all of those things may be components of the relationship with the Lord, when we grow in maturity and we become sanctified and holy and more like him over a period of time, we will find out that the end result is not supposed to be that I just got better. God does things for the good of the kingdom of God. In fact, our purpose gets very clearly outlined of all places in the Old Testament before we even make it into the New Testament. Isaiah 43, 7 the prophet speaks on behalf of the Lord and says, everyone who is called by my name, and here it is, whom I created for my glory, says the Lord, whom I formed and made. What is my purpose in Christ? So that I can be blessed and be better and not go to hell? No. So that I can be anointed and share the gospel and tell everybody about Jesus? No. So that God will be glorified. Everyone who is called by my name, I created for my glory. We hear that from the Lord himself, and it gets reiterated by Jesus, and people somehow don't catch it. Even when they look at the ministry of the Savior, what they catch is, well, the Lord healed people, and he loved people, and he was kind to people, but he had a purpose in that so that you would see his Father and all that he did. A better way to look at that statement about God having good things for me is not to say that God wants good things for me, but God wants all things done for his glory and I will benefit when I yield to his will. This is something more similar to what's actually happening if we call ourselves disciples of Christ. See, God's goal is different than ours is, and even as Christians, God's goal is different than mine. We understand that the goal of the world is something different than, than that of the disciple of Christ, but even as Christians, God's goal is not the same as mine. His idea of good things could not be farther from my own. And so I need God's perspective on goodness. In fact, Jesus himself, when approached and called good in Mark 10, 18, says, whoa, 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 there's none good but God. Why did you call me good? And he's the son of God. If anybody could claim goodness, it would be the son of God. He says, no, 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 look at my father. Here's the standard. What I do points back to him. Everything I do is a reflection of him. God's idea of good is very different than mine. When God is considered as being a, a holy God and a righteous God and a God of justice and also a God of grace, we have to realize that, yes, he does want good things for us. He wants what's best for us in the context of what's good for the kingdom. It would be fair to say that, yes, God wants good things for you, but not what you think is best. David talks about this in this passage, and it's fascinating to me that David is able to talk about the grace and the goodness of God before we had even seen it in the way that we understand it through the life of Christ. More importantly, through the death and resurrection of Christ. David uses terms that are common and familiar to people to talk about the grace of God. And he uses this euphemism or this, this picture of a shepherd. He describes the Lord as my shepherd. And there are three things implied in shepherding. I don't meet a whole lot of people who understand the job of a shepherd in the sense that the Hebrew people would have, in the sense that David knew it. David was pretty fairly acquainted from all of the days he'd spent on the hillside with nothing but his harp and his weapons and hundreds of his father's sheep and goats and lions and tigers and bears, oh my. David came in smelling like the sheep many, many times. David came in hot and sweaty and tired and understood what it took to keep the sheep safe to make sure the sheep produced in a profitable way, to make sure that they grew in a way that pleased the Lord. So there's, there's some implication in the Lord being a shepherd that we miss just right out of the gate. To say the Lord is a shepherd implies three things. First of all, the shepherd gives us a place to graze. He determines what we consume and knows better than we do what we should. The second thing that is implied in the Lord being a shepherd is that he will defend and protect us so long as we remain in his presence. The third thing is a shepherd will hold us accountable for our actions. Let's talk about these three things tonight for a few minutes. Psalm 23 verses 2 and 3 say he leads me for his name's sake right there really quickly for the glory of God, for his name's sake. But this is the leading. He will lead me to a place to feed me. 
God leads me to places to graze, leads me to the places where he says, this is what is safe for you to consume, and this is a safe place for you to consume it, and this will benefit you in the context of benefiting the entire kingdom. See, David understood he's not just taking care of the sheep so dad doesn't discipline him. David is taking care of the sheep because he understands this is the livelihood of my family, and it is for the benefit of everyone involved that all of these sheep do well. It's not because I love this sheep so much that I want this one to stay safe. I need the sheep to stay safe because there is a bigger purpose at hand. He leads me for his name's sake. So God leads me for his purpose and to the place that he says is best along a path that he has set for me. He leads me to the place that is best suited to prepare me for what he most needs or desires from me. He's not preparing me for my best life. He's preparing me for the best version of the kingdom that he can present through me for his own sake. If God only seems to be leading you along pleasant paths that benefit you, then there's a good chance that it's not God you're following at all. Because God's path is not always going to be the most pleasant or the most enjoyable or the most convenient. It's going to lead you to what's best for the kingdom of God demonstrated through you. If I say I'm just being led to places and the Lord's just blessing me and giving me more boats and more money and a bigger church and a happier life and better kids and better food and more opportunities, that would mean I'm being led for my sake. Where's the Lord in that? He leads us for his name's sake. Be wary of a gospel or of a shepherd or of a relationship or of a church or of anything that says I am representative of the Lord, but all it does is lead you toward what does best for you. God leads us to places for his own sake, and those paths will always cause me to depend on him. If it is easy for me to walk there, I don't need any help. If it's for his name's sake, I need him so that he can demonstrate his purpose and his plan and his greatness. Just the journey from here to there will prove that I needed him. I'm being led for his name's sake. When I'm walking the way he wants me to walk in the direction he wants me to go, I will learn to understand and accept him the way that he is and not how I want him to be. Because I will find when I'm in a dangerous place, what I want is out and what he wants me is through. When I'm in a difficult and hard place, I will find that what I want to do is sit down and quit and give up and might even say, I'm going to check out on this whole life thing altogether. And the Lord says, no, I have a purpose in this, even in the difficulty. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take care of you, but it's in the place and in the way that I have in mind. And I'm going to give you what's necessary to get there. And you will find out that you will run out of your own ability on the way. You're going to have to depend on me because even the trip, even the journey from one place to another is going to require us to depend on him. It's not that he's going to store me up with everything in this season so that I now on my own can make it from here to the next place when all my resources will be depleted. He's going to lead you every step from there to here. It's all for his glory, every bit of it. He leads me for his name's sake. Most often, what we struggle with is, leading, is letting him lead us and depending on him when we can't see the outcome. But most often, what he wants us to do is learn to trust him and depend on him even before we see the end result, even before I see the final destination. I have my friend I'm looking at right now, and I know he's on a journey with the Lord where he's not sure where he's going to end up, quite literally. Perhaps I'll have, you t have him tell his story at some other point while he's here for the next couple of weeks. But we talk about the Lord leading us, and what we want is a map, and we want a plan, and we want a goal, and we want to be able to tick the boxes and say we're 30% we're there, we're 60% there. This is hard today, but I can see how great glory is going to be. Praise God, brother. Eternally, perhaps, yes, we can bank on that, but I have no clue what the process is going to look like between here and there. And I may not even know where there is, except that it is the will and purpose of God when I arrive. God leads us for his name's sake. I've got to trust him before I see where he's leading. David, who wrote the 23rd Psalm, also wrote another passage, Psalm 119, that we quote frequently in that verse 105. That word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. That's a very interesting verse because it sounds very exciting, but we think of a path being lit the way we want it lit. We think we have those nice little LED lights under the edge of every stair. 
and we have the nice little little torches on the side of the sidewalk all the way and even if it's winding and goes up the side of the hill and there's steps and back down the hill and we have to climb the tree and around the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we want a light every bit of the way but this says this is a lamp a lamp unto my feet in fact, there's a reference to this where oftentimes they would walk with either a lamp in their hand or a lamp on a string of some sort. And it would be so dark sometimes when shepherds would walk from one place to another. They're going through a valley. The sun has gone down. They still have to get home or get to the next field where they literally cannot even look straight ahead and see. They've got to look at the ground and see what gets lit up next so they know where to put their foot. A light unto my feet, unto my path. We have to trust him with every single step, sometimes one at a time. Sometimes we don't even have the benefit of lifting my eyes to see where I'm going because I will misstep what's in front of me if I'm not looking at what he's lit up for me in the season that I'm in. One step at a time, a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. See, God wants to take you to that place that will sustain you and will fulfill you and will do all that he's promised that he will do. And we know that's the end result. He tells us that at the very beginning. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I have nothing that I need that has not been provided for me. Verse 1. But then we learn what it looks like to get there. God will lead you to a place that will sustain you and provide all of that stuff. But he's going to do it for his purpose, for his name, in his time. He's leading us to feed us. It's the implication of shepherd. The second thing I want to look at is or Psalm 23, verse 4, the second half. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. That second thing that he does is defend and protect us so long as we remain in his presence. Walking through the valley, if we're following the Lord, if that light is one step at a time right in front of us, and we know that the Lord goes ahead of us, we can go wherever we want. We misinterpret this frequently, though, and we think, well, I have the Spirit of God living inside of me, and because I have been fed at the previous place where I was, and the Lord led me in this direction, I'm just going to storm off being a mighty man of God into the dark, and the demons will flee ahead of me, and I will arise victorious. I will come to the other end, and everyone will say, look at the wonderful work of God, because I was empowered to. How many times are we going to say I and me in the course of that sentence? This does not speak of wandering off into the dark alone to prove something as if God needs my help to prove a single thing. This is not speaking of me being able to run off into sin and come out unscathed. This is not talking about me finding the dark places and going to prove God is great by turning the lights on for them. If God doesn't lead you into that darkness, if he's not ahead of you, you have no business being in it. Don't go there. This is not about exploring boundaries or pushing the borders for your own sake or because of, you, of your agenda and your interpretation of what God's goodness is. This says, I will fear no evil because you are with me. This is about following and trusting God. And if I go where he leads me, he absolutely will protect me. But if I find myself looking around and I can't find him, I've missed the mark. I've lost the path. I need to return to where the Lord is. God will follow or we will follow the Lord and we have to go where he leads because he defends and protects and he will do so violently and at all costs so long as we remain in his presence and in his will. But we have to stay away from the dark except when God leads us there. If he leads us there, then we can be assured. If I find myself in a dark place and I do see God ahead of me, I have absolute confidence that this is the path to righteousness and I'm going to be sustained through this. But if I can't see him from where I'm standing, I have to question, where have I wandered? Philippians 4.13, we misquote this so often. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can charge off into the dark and fight devils and cast out demons. I've seen that go poorly even in my own Bible. If you read some stories, there's some places that say, this doesn't mean I can do whatever I want because I have Christ. This means Christ will empower me to do what he needs done as long as I am with him. When we see the darkness ahead, if he's not going, we don't go. We have no reason to go. We have no cause to go. Perhaps someone else is even going. And you can, I have seen this happen so often, and I've been guilty of it in my own life. I look at you, and you have a great anointing upon your life, and I'm following you, man of God. And suddenly I realize I don't see God here, and I'm getting beat up, and he's fine. Why? Because God didn't send me there. I followed a man into the dark. If you don't see the Lord ahead of you, you have no business going. 
You have no reason or no cause to go. Because if you go there alone, your destruction is absolutely assured, just as surely as your protection is if you stay in the presence of the Almighty. God will protect us where he leads us, no matter how difficult it looks. He protects us where he leads us. He defends us where he sends us. But when he leads, there's no reason to be afraid. We just have to be sure he's actually the one leading. So he takes us somewhere to feed us. And he defends and protects us in the darkness. And the Lord is our shepherd. Also, we see in Psalm 23, 4, the second half, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They hold me accountable and they prevent me from wandering places. This is where I was talking to my friend this week. Those two tools that the, the, uh, that the shepherd would have had, a, a staff, a long stick. First of all, it would have been good for walking, especially if you're not sure of the terrain. It would have been good to hold me up and keep me steady. In fact, even if I'm injured, I can lean on something like a staff and hold me up and make myself through a difficult terrain, even with my ankle turned or my knee broken or even if I'm missing a leg. It's possible to survive if I have something stronger than myself to lean on that's more stable than I am, the staff. Also, it's interesting to watch shepherds. They can lead you with or lead sheep with their staff because they can reach out a long distance and just kind of tap you on the side. Hey, don't wander off over there. Come back over here. I need you this way. Okay, good job. Well done. The staff brings direction. The Lord will lead us, and sometimes he will lead from the front, and sometimes he will lead from the rear and expect us, to, I've told you that's where I need you to go. The leading is the direction I gave you, and then I'm watching from back here, and perhaps you need some correction. Nah, 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 nah. Not that. The staff helps us know the direction and feeling that gentle nudge when you're off course. There's a comfort in that, in knowing that as long as I'm in the presence of God, I'm defended, I'm protected, I'm on my way to all the provision that I'll need. I've been loaded up with everything I needed before I left. And if I happen to wander off, there's great comfort in the correction of God. Difficult to get the children on board with that idea. Difficult to get the kids on board with the idea of being comfortable in correction. I don't like being told no. I don't like being told I can't. And if you're going to tell me no, I at least need a good reason. No, you're not entitled to a reason. Sometimes it's just that your parents or your grandparents or your teachers or the Lord or your pastor or the man that's mentoring you knows better and sees what you cannot see. And perhaps you can't even understand and don't yet have the maturity for them to explain to you. Or sometimes the urgency of the situation is such that I don't have time to tell you because if I take 15 minutes to explain the velocity of the oncoming car to you and why that would be detrimental to your person, you're already dead before the explanation is done. There's great comfort in the correction of God or the, the directing and correcting of God that comes from the staff, that gentle tap. Comfort, stability, peace that I can have, even in knowing the Lord is not going to let me die. Okay, I thought it would look this way, Lord. I had expectations when I arrived, and they've not been met. It's okay, son. It's okay, daughter. Just slide a little to the left, and it's going to be fine. Oh, thank you, Lord. Rather than, but I thought, and why do I have to, and you always are telling me, and, and, but you said, and you're not even listening when I talk. There's peace and comfort in knowing the Lord doesn't want you to fall off the edge. He doesn't want the oncoming car to get you. He doesn't want to lead you into a place where there's an army that's going to destroy you that you didn't know was waiting there. The staff, it gives us some direction and corrects our course. And then the rod is a little bit different. The rod's got a couple of purposes. The rod was a club that the shepherd would use. Primarily, it was a defense against animals. David would have been very familiar with one of these. Oftentimes, the, the rod had two sides, and it had, you know, it was a shorter thing, about half the length of a baseball bat, really fat on one end. And on one side, it would have had, like, piece of pieces of rock and stone and broken metal and something sharp and hard. And it would have torn flesh, cracked bone when it made an impact. It's primarily used for defense against the animals that would come to destroy the sheep, and that's nice to know. I'd love to have some big burly guy that followed me around all the time and would just crack the skulls of anybody that offended me or came against me or had anything bad to say. That would be wonderful. The idea that I have a God that will defend me to the death, literally, the death of his son on the cross against the enemies that came for us, but figuratively, even as David is talking about, David, who knows full well what it means to kill the lion and kill the bear and even defeat the one who would come against the army of the Lord. There's a God that will crack some skulls for us. That's wonderful to know. 
there's peace and comfort in that, but there's also the other side of that rod, which was generally wrapped in leather and probably bound up with some sort of strapping twine, leather, sh leather cords of some sort, and it's not as hard, it's not as abrasive, but it certainly has a greater impact up against the side of the skull of a stupid sheep that won't go the direction you want it to when you've tapped it with the staff and said, I need you to follow my direction, and you don't, so whoa, i got to get your attention. i got to get through the fluff of your fur and your wool, and i got to get to your skull, and i got to hit it hard enough that it will cause you to think a little bit differently because you're not paying attention. There's less peace and comfort in that if I think about that with my human mind, and yet that same rod that was used to destroy the enemy sometimes is the same force necessary to get me into the will of God when I'm being stubborn and determined to walk off and kill myself. Sometimes sheep are fluffy and stupid and need a little bit stronger correction when they don't respond to the tap of a staff. I didn't know a whole lot about sheep until I moved here and I met another minister friend of mine who had a shepherd in his congregation at one point and told me about a meal that he had. And he sat down at this congregation member's house and a storm comes up and all of a sudden the, the farmer jumps up and says, Pastor, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to come help me. He's like, what are we going to do? He says, just follow me. I'll show you what to do. We have to go right the sheep. My friend had no idea what that even meant. And they go out in the rain, and he finds out that some of the sheep, well, most of the sheep are so dumb that if you don't lead them into the barn, they will get so saturated with water that they just, their knees buckle, and they collapse into the mud, and they will drown standing out in a field because they won't go get dry. Their face will get stuck in a puddle. You have to right them, as in put them back upright, and sometimes struggle and WWE wrestle them down the path all the way into the barn and then dry them off and clean them and make sure that they are healthy enough to stand on their own and haven't hurt themselves because they're not smart enough to get out of the rain. We have that beautiful picture of the Lord is my shepherd and I am a cute fluffy little sheep and I'm his favorite little pet that he rescued from the pound. But sheep are stupid. He's not telling us that we're such wonderful cute little things that he just wants to love us and hug us and squeeze us and call us George. What he wants to do is make sure we're not so dumb and he doesn't mean you're stupid in the sense that your intellect is broken, but compared to the goodness and the knowledge and the wisdom of God, we don't have a whole lot going for us. And he needs us to realize the difference between the knowledge and the wisdom and the purpose of the shepherd and a sheep is the difference that there is between his thinking and mine. So my, my pastor friend learned about going out to right the sheep and learned that they're not the smartest things in the world. And sometimes we don't respond to direction, and so we need correction. If we ignore the staff, we get the rod. Correction comes with accountability. Correction means I've made something known to you, and now I'm going to hold you accountable to make sure that you're going to follow through on it. Correction means accountability, and accountability requires a response. We don't get to just sit around and soak up the knowledge and wisdom of God and say, oh yeah, I remember one time God said a really smart thing to me. Now I'm going to say a really smart thing to you. Don't I sound really smart? <sighs> spend five minutes on the internet you'll find out there's a lot of people giving themselves titles or posturing it themselves as if they are great teachers and basically what they're doing is parroting smart things that other people said that other people said that other people said that God said one time and somewhere down the line they stopped doing anything and being accountable for what the Lord had said into their life correction comes with accountability which requires response in fact accountability is the opposite of an excuse an excuse is the expect it, it communicates the expectation that I am the exception to this rule. Well, the reason I didn't turn my homework in on time is because there were outside forces at play that kept me from being able to pick up my pencil and write this paper. The reason that I am late for work is because it should only take four minutes to go through Starbucks. And this morning it took 11 because of those slow people in front of me. It's not my fault. An excuse is the expectation that I am the exception, and you will be on board with the fact that the rules don't apply to me. It's really a bold and brazen and prideful thing to say that I have a good reason for not doing what you said do, because what I'm saying is I'm so sure that I don't have to play by the rules that you who are in charge will agree with me. When we take that attitude to the Lord, that's very telling of what we think of the Lord and of what we think of ourselves. But Lord, there's a reason that I... You want God to agree with you that it's okay for you to be wrong when Scripture is very clear that he has no part in darkness. We place blame on something else rather than being accountable. Accountability is taking ownership of the consequence just as thoroughly and willingly as we will take ownership of the reward for our actions.
Accountability means I've done something well and now I'm glad to receive the blessing of this new boat or this, this pocket full of money or this esteemed position that you've given me. It means that I'm just as eager and just as willing to accept, you're right, Lord, I've done the wrong thing. I acted out of your time. Perhaps it's cost me something. Not pleasant. Not fun to think about. But that's accountability in the context of what David is talking about in this psalm. You lead me through this difficult place. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that you've held me accountable so that I actually learn a lesson. The qu- one of my favorite quotes is from a man who says that, that success never taught anyone anything. We learn things through failure because the lesson gets taught when we come up short. I've made a mistake. I've reaped the consequences. Now I will be more likely to remember. Winning just teaches me that I'm really smart and I'm really good and doggone it, people like me. Winning teaches me that the rules don't apply to me. Grace teaches me that there's, there's no consequence for my actions if I misapply it. Accountability and receiving correction, the ability to be accountable and receive correction, that's a marker for your maturity is what that is. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I can receive your correction and direction with a good attitude. Eager and actually thankful that you care so much about me, Lord, that you would invest that in my life. There's a reason that the rod is what gets used for correction in the way that it does. It's interesting because the rod gets used against the attacking animal, but also to correct the sheep that insist on wandering. Why does, why does the Lord, why does the shepherd use the same implement? Because both the enemy that comes to destroy the sheep and the sheep that is acting out of the will of the shepherd, both of them are behaving in a way that is deserving of a consequence because they are not serving the shepherd's purpose. The rod works for both, and that's not a coincidence. You look at Matthew 12, 30, and you see Jesus speaking, and he says, anyone who is not with me is against me. That phrase, with me, in context, in the words that Jesus would have used speaking in Hebrew, I know it was written in Greek, the New Testament, but the word Jesus would have said out of his mouth is the same phrase as Psalm 23, 4, that says, you are with me. Anyone who is not with me is against me. Your rod and your staff comfort me, you are with me. It's the same phrase phrasing that Jesus uses and that David uses. We're either on the side of Christ or we're against him. And a sheep determined to wander is just as much in opposition to the will of the shepherd as an animal that would come to destroy a sheep. And this is where we get to learn what grace is. Thank you, Pastor. I'm glad we're going to get to that. This has been hard. We had to walk a long way to get to grace. You said we were going to talk about living in the grace of God. This is where we see grace because the rod gets used to its full potential to kill the enemy that's coming to destroy the sheep. But the rod's only used to the point of reception and correction with the sheep that will respond and follow. With the sheep that the shepherd loves, he only corrects with that rod to the point that they finally yield and say, I'll follow where you want me to go. See, God does have a destination in mind. We find that out at the very beginning of this, this, uh, this psalm that David writes. And there's a place where he plans for us to be and he plans for us to meet with him. He plans for us to eat there. He's going to lead us where he can feed us. He's going to defend and protect us along the way. And he's going to correct us and direct us to get there. He has a plan for us to be in a place. David speaks of this as a shepherd, talks about leading a a flock to a stream, and Jesus reiterates that same concept with his disciples, that he's preparing a place for us. You know John 14, 2, where he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. It's the same concept that David's talking about here. I've got a destination in mind. God is absolutely determined to meet with you, to sit with you, and to provide for you in the context of what is best for the kingdom of God and his glory. And there is no limit to the number of times that he will prepare a place for you There's no limit to the number of times that he will meet with you. There is no limit to the places that he will go to do so. He's desperate. And I know people hate that word when we talk about God. It's not that God has no other resource. It's just I use desperate in the term that, or the sense that God is so eager to be with you, there's nothing he won't do short of bringing sin into the kingdom of God to be where you are. Psalm 23, 5 says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. This tells me God will go anywhere. 
because we've read this psalm up to this point, and we see the Lord is leading us. David says, we're going from this place to that place, and we might go through some hard places, but as long as I'm in your presence, you defend and protect me, and we have a great destination in mind. And all of a sudden, he throws this verse in that out of context, by itself, it doesn't even seem to make sense. It's almost like you could remove it from the passage. Why is it even there? I could ask the same question of you when we're talking about following the Lord and leading or going where he leads. Why are you among your enemies? There's only one answer to that question. If the Lord is seeking to lead me on the right path and he's got all the tools in place and has done everything necessary and his heart is to be with me for his glory and for his sake in every situation and he's told me he promises to keep the enemy away from me, there's only one way I end up in the presence of the enemy. There's only one way that I end up where they are. It's because I chose to be there. I wandered off and I picked them. The Lord is not setting a table for me in the presence of my enemies just to look at my enemies and go, nah, nah, I love him more than you. It's not a playground game, and the Lord is not going to have that kind of nasty attitude just to show off in front of his enemies. That's a pet phrase that bothers me. God really showed off today. God did what God does, and it's so far beyond us we should always think he's showing off. Why do we have to act like he's showing off just because all of a sudden I got something good that I can show you that he did for me? Yeah. Playground nasty attitude. Anyway, I'll, will you take this soapbox and put it somewhere else? I'll get off of that. He will go to wherever we are. The reason I find myself among my enemies when we're talking about this journey of going to where God wants me, the reason I would be there is because I chose to be there. Somewhere along the way, I refused direction and I refused correction and I left the path and I walked off into a dark place where he didn't lead. And now I'm stuck there. But verse 5, this passage, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. It's another picture of grace. In the same way that he uses the rod only to the point of getting me to pay attention, he also comes and shows up because he's determined to prepare for me and make sure I have what I need to get out of the place of danger and into the place he's prepared. If I can paraphrase that, that part of that passage, the Lord says, I had a place prepared for you. We were headed somewhere, and I was leading you in the right way, but you didn't choose it. But there's hope because I prepared another place. You wouldn't join me in the field where I tried to take you. So I've come out here into the middle of the darkness of the woods where the enemy has camped out and wants to eat you and destroy you. I've come here into the valley where you've decided I'm not going another step further because it's too hard, and I don't like it, and I don't want to be here, and I don't trust you, Lord. I've come here into the dark that you've chosen to wrap yourself in hoping that I won't see. I've come here even when you have spit in my face and told me I would rather be among my enemies than be in your presence, God. I'm so determined to prepare a place for you that I've even come here. I know the rod hurt you. I was simply trying to get your attention. Today, that rod that hurt you, I'll use it to defend you to get you out of here. I've set a table even here. Will you join me here? Will you let me provide for you here? And will you follow me out of this place so we can head back to where I had in mind? Will you meet me here and will you let me lead you again? You've set a table in the presence of my enemies. Another of those verses that we like to quote to further our own means is Jeremiah 29 11. I know the plans I have for you. This is the declaration of the Lord. The plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God has a plan and it's not his. Or it's not mine, it's his. God has a way and it's not mine, it's his. God is not saying, here's the plan, go make it happen. He's saying, even when you wander off from it, I still had a place. I was leading you by still waters to a place where you can rest, where I want to fulfill you. And your one little mistake your one immature outburst, that one error that you made, no matter how big or how small, is not so big that I can't rescue you from it. I want to remind you I have a plan. I've declared it, and I'll come here to rescue you from your mess again if you'll follow me out. His plan is not mine. The result of his plan is goodness and hope, but it may not look good in the way I define goodness, and it may not feel hopeful in the way that I define hope, and the blessing may not be the blessing that I said I wanted. In fact, we're almost guaranteed that goodness and hope and blessing the way I envision them are not what God has in mind. 
His plan will certainly lead me into the dark alone. It will lead me through a place where there is the presence of the enemy. But the result of his plan will be what he says. It will be wellness and a great future and hope. But I have to understand those are eternal declarations, not temporary earthly ones. And even if they are natural things that the Lord does for me, if it does end up with money in my pocket and a nice car to drive and the benefits of things in this world that will help facilitate me doing the work of the Lord, tangible things that other people look at and become jealous of, like my title or my congregation or the work that the Lord's called me to do in the ministry that he's given me, even if they are natural benefits like that. Because they are for some people in some situations and in some seasons of their life. The truth of the matter is the journey to them is not always easy. It's not always pleasant. In fact, I can promise you that the journey to a place where the Lord blesses someone tangibly, if it's truly the Lord who has blessed them, hear that caveat. If it's truly the Lord that blessed them, I can promise you their journey to that place was difficult and uncomfortable and unpleasant. And I promise you that they still feel the weight of the responsibility there just as heavily as anyone who's ever been through any difficulty feels it. If anything, the men who are truly doing the work of God, the women that are truly doing the work that the Lord's called them to do in a place where they've been entrusted with natural blessings, that weight is certainly heavy. It is certainly hard. Because their, their focus is still on following the Lord, and they're aware of what you look at them and think. Oh, the Lord's blessed them. It's not hard for them anymore. Oh, look at what they have going for them. It's funny, I run into that as small as what we do here is. And I'm not making fun of how small or how big it is. I'm simply saying I have people that look and they go, oh, you have these followers online. Oh, you've got this ministry. Oh, you have this. Oh, well, you only have to work four hours a week just so you can talk to us through a camera. They don't see what it took to get here. And if you got here and saw what it really looked like, you would realize that it's probably not really all that great. <laughs> but we're serving the Lord and doing what the Lord's asked. And I find that more often is the story with the people that are doing what the Lord's asked them to. I mean, I'm looking at two people in this room right now who have given up literally everything they own to do what the Lord's asked them to do. I'm looking at people right now in this room who have changed their life, not just the two of you, but I don't know a single person in this room, even on the Sunday mornings when we have almost everyone here that shows up, I don't know anyone that's not fought a fight or a battle or is not carrying a burden right now that affects their connection to this church and affects their connection to the work of the Lord because we're blessed to have a congregation of people that actually love doing what God says and none of them are doing it on easy terms with great blessings that people can see. God's plan will absolutely certainly lead you into the dark and it will be uncomfortable and it will be hard and even when it's not, there's no guarantee that the journey to that place that looks so great to other people is going to be an easy one. And even when you arrive there, there is no guarantee that it's just one good trip you got to take to one good destination and now the hard times are over. There's not just one great destination. There are many stops on the way from here to eternity. And perhaps you're looking at someone that had an easy walk for a season. And someone who got a great blessing for a season, but the Lord is certainly preparing them for one that will not be that way because it never remains. The enemy comes, and the Lord has to defend and protect. He wouldn't promise to do it if there wasn't a guarantee that it was coming. The Lord has a plan. So that even the worst thing that you encounter will not be the end of you if you will depend on him to lead you and care for you and protect you. If you will trust him and you will find peace and comfort in his direction and his correction. The plan of the Lord is a lifetime of being led and of being submitted and of bringing him glory. It's not a walk to a place that we get to hang out until he shows up again. The plan is a lifetime of moving from place to place and becoming sanctified and holy and broken and remade into his image over time. Paul gets to the end of his life, and even he says, I've not yet achieved this. I still have my faith, but I've not yet reached the goal. I've run the race, and even as I lay here dying, having to dictate my letters to other people so that they can be written and delivered to you because my circumstances won't allow me to write in my own hand, even here, I've not yet reached the great place because I'm still living and I still have more work to do for the Lord. If Paul says that, then so it is with us. The Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing that I need 
He defends me. He protects me. He leads me. He holds me accountable for my actions, and I praise him. I'm grateful for it. The Lord is my shepherd, and he wants what's best for the kingdom of God, not just what's best for me. But I will benefit from that so long as I remain in his presence. And he will lead me to what is best for the kingdom of God and allow me by his grace to participate in the goodness of it so long as I'll remain in him. That is the definition of a life lived in grace. This is the communication of David to us in the 23rd Psalm. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this evening for your presence here in this house. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to read your word, and I thank you for speaking so clearly to us through it. I thank you, Lord, for being honest enough to tell us of the difficulty in equal measure to the reward and the glory that come from serving you. I thank you that you care enough for us to tell us what it will be like. I'm grateful that you defend and protect and correct and direct us. I'm grateful, Lord, that you do plan to sustain us. And I'm grateful, Lord, that you hold us accountable so that we actually can learn and become more like you because there's nothing greater than the opportunity to be in your presence and for someone to look at us and say, I see the Father in you. Lord, make us in your image. Direct us, correct us, guide us, lead us, provide for us, and give us hearts that are responsive to you, Father. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for being here tonight. It's been good to be with you. I'll see you again soon.